When I was writing a TV show, the Dilbert TV show, it had to be, I think, 22 minutes or something. And I would write a script. And then the only way they could make it fit the 22 minutes, because I didn't want to be short, so I made it longer than 22, they would cut the only things you could cut without losing the you know connecting tissue of the story. And that turned out to be the jokes. Hello there, ladies, gentlemen, and as always, everyone in between. My name is Clifton Duncan. This is my podcast. Thank you so much for joining me for yet another fascinating conversation living at the nexus of art, entertainment, culture, and society. We have one of the most fascinating people around here with us today. You don't want to miss it. But first, however you're consuming this podcast, be it Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, whatever, Wherever you prefer to scratch your CDP itch, please make sure to leave a like, a comment, or a review if you're nasty. If you're watching on YouTube, I would greatly appreciate you if you subscribed. And as always, you can help this podcast grow by sharing the show as much as humanly possible. If you love it, share it with your friends. And if you hate it, why then share it with your enemies. Lastly, I am a one-man operation. I prefer not to be a starving artist, so... uh. Whether you sign up at Locals or become a paid subscriber to my new newsletter, The State of the Arts, or donate via PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App, I'll love you forever, and it'll keep me bringing you the super hot fire like you're about to hear today. Now, all that said, uh, my guest today is one of the most interesting people uh, alive. Uh, he's a trained hypnotist with degrees in both economics and business. He's also a best-selling author of books such as 2013's How to Fail at Everything and Still Win Big and 2019's Loser Think, pertinent today's, to today's conversation. And his latest book, Reframe Your Brain, is out right now. The hardcover just came out, as a matter of fact. We were talking about it right before we came on. Um, but most likely you know him as the creator of, of uh, excuse me, the creator tour of Dilbert, one of the most popular comic strips of all time. Um, and last but not least, he's the creator and host of Real Coffee with Scott Adams. So without further ado, it is such a delight to welcome Scott Adams to the podcast. How are you, good sir? I'm amazing. Actually, today was the soft cover launch. We're doing it backwards. We're going to do soft cover first because people like to spend less money sometimes. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure why that is. I can't imagine why that might be. Well, I'll, I'll leave it to the economics man uh, to uh, <laughs> to, for, to work that out. Um, I'm, I'm laughing because uh, right before we came on, um, I, I don't worry, I'm okay, but I, I puked my guts out all over uh, my, my bathroom. So I had to kind of take a, a little delay and uh, shower myself off. But uh, Mr. Adams was very uh, kind and flexible. But uh, so that's why I'm laughing a little bit. But uh, I, I guess I have my, my first question for you. Um, this has to, I think you're on... Since I've since you've been on my radar, maybe you're on your fourth or fifth cancellation. I I don't I've I've lost count at this point. Uh, how are you holding up in in the midst of all of this uh, uh, destruction of your career? Uh, you know, it, it's not really destruction. It's more like uh, rebirth or respawning or something like that. You know, if this had happened when I was 25 or 30 or something, it would be catastrophic. It happened when I was 65 and I was desperately looking for a way to retire. <laughs> so, really. So instead of retiring, I'm actually, you know, working twice as hard as I ever did, but I'm only doing things I want. So the, the Dilbert comic has continued, but I can do an uncensored, completely fun version that's just a delight to write. So I've gone from hating my job and desperately thinking about how can I retire? You know, how can I get out of here? And then the decision was made for me. And I thought, am I the luckiest person in the world? Because I didn't plan this. But it was exactly what I needed at exactly the right time. So people are giving me a lot of empathy and sympathy, and I really appreciate it because, you know, it's the right sentiment. But honestly, I've, I haven't had a better year. That's so fascinating, you know, because but I don't know, I feel like I'm going to push back a little bit because there were, I saw the, an interview you gave, maybe it was in 2020, where uh, you were talking about how you 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 felt as though um, newspapers in particular were going sort of the way of the dodo bird. So you were looking for a way to reinvent yourself um, in, the, in the for a post pandemic world. So I don't know, man, I feel like you're a bit you're a bit craftier than, than you're letting on right now. <laughs> well, let, let me give you the, the full answer is 
that I, I expected to get some pushback. I expected maybe a newspaper or two would cancel me because I, I was increasingly edgy in a variety of ways. So I knew I was pushing the envelope, uh, but I didn't expect it to, to crash all at once. That, that was kind of a phenomenon I was not expecting because it turns out that if you get the choke points, if you get the syndication company and the publishing company, that cancels me worldwide. So I had to had to independently publish my book with uh, Joshua Lysak, helping on the editing and the the business part, and I could not be happier. I, I feel a sense of creative freedom and business freedom that I've actually never had, because you know when you're starting out, you have a little bit of freedom, but you have to do everything right because you want to you you want to succeed in the normal way. But at the moment, I have the freest speech of anybody in the country. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm pre-canceled. What are you going to do? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, I, I've made sort of a, um, well, I was going to say a career. I mean, people with careers make money, but, uh, you know, I've, I've made a series out of um, interviewing quote unquote canceled people. And, and what I find is that they're, they always seem to be really, really just interesting and great people. And so it makes me think about, um, <clears throat> and this is a conversation I've had with multiple people over especially over the past three years, um, it seems like every single institution, whether you're talking about art and entertainment, or you're talking about media or uh, health or law, um, it seems like there are people who are stuck, or public health, there are people who are stuck within this machine, so to speak. And, um, you know, they're, they're comfortable, they might be living nice lives, but, uh, but then people who get pushed out of it, uh, I just find that there, there's always something really you know, it's one thing if you're like, you know, sort of a wacko kind of, you know, neo uh, Nazi or something. And it's like, well, maybe, you, maybe, you know, you should work on that. But for the most part, I found that the, especially the artists that uh, I've spoken to uh, just are just really fascinating people. And they've just sort of been belched out of this um, ailing beast, the belly of this ailing beast or, the, or this dying beast. And so, you know, you seem to me to be just yet another example of, uh, you know, it's, go through it, go through the fire, go through the hell, but, uh, you know, but speak speak your mind and really, uh, really put yourself out there. And it's going to end up better for you in the long run. You know, I, th I think there are at least two things going on. One is that creative people, if you're, if you're good at being creative, you're going to be pushing boundaries. So you would expect the people testing the boundaries would be canceled first. But the other thing that the general public is completely oblivious to, <clears throat> but I'm pretty sure you're, you're keyed into it because you're, you know, following uh, news and politics. But people like me are political figures. Now, if you ask uh, any group of 100 people if they know that I'm a political figure, they'd say no. They might not even refer to the comic. But if you understand that political figures are being taken off the board before a major presidential election, then my cancellation starts to, to look like part of a pattern. Mm. So what a lot of people don't know is I'm probably, uh, it depends who you talk to, but top 10, top 40 influencer in politics. Now that sounds ridiculous if you don't follow politics really in some granular form, but it's a fact. Well, you know, it's fascinating because I remember you're in the, the first book of yours that I read, which was a how to fail at everything and win big, you know, you, you uh, wrote about, um, well, and you talk about it a lot, right? About persuasion, and you wrote about business writing and psychology, and uh, you know, it's and it seems because for a while, if I'm if I'm, this is a full on confession right now, full disclosure, because uh, you know, over some of the COVID stuff, I was like, man, I did this like rage unfollow. I didn't announce it to you. <laughs> I didn't like you know tweet. I'm like I'm I'm unfollowing you now. Um, but it was funny because. <clears throat> You know, I got I got annoyed, but I was all but I felt bad because I was like, you know, I always want to see what he has to say. And just the way your way with language, your way of getting your point um, across is um, I, I find it to be provocative. I find it to be funny. Um, I find it often to be insightful. And, uh, you know, I, it's just it's it is interesting well, to me. But, but let me ask you something. Yeah. Are you aware that there was a massive hoax that reversed my pandemic opinions? Do you even know my pandemic opinions? Because, because the hoax was that I was in favor of masks, in favor of vaccinations, and in favor of lockdowns. None of those are true. Are you aware you mean, of that? You mean the hoax in terms of people, um, what's the word, imagining your opinions? No, not imagining. It, look, it, looks, it looked organized, or possibly there are just some trolls on 4chan who was having some fun. 
but eventually it turned into memes and 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 because the the anti i guess the anti restrictions people were looking for targets and they decided i was one although i was never against them hmm. yeah because well in terms of a hoax um I mean, I guess to answer your question, I would say no, because it seemed it seemed to me from what I was looking at, and this is, you know, months and months ago now at this point, it almost seems like ages ago, where it, it I, I didn't think that you were full in on everything that was going on, but it did seem like you were on the other side of the issue uh, to me. So maybe I was hallucinating. That's the word you use, hallucinating probably your opinions. Not, probably not. Mm -hmm. probably, uh, give, give me one example of something you think where you and I disagreed on the pandemic. Watch what happens. Oh boy! Give me one um, example. Well, I suppose the subject of, and I hope I don't get demonetized, but uh, the uh, the vaccines. Um, I do uh, remember. Do, do, well, hold on. Where, do you think that I recommended that people get vaccinated? No, 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 no. I, I never saw you, you know, say that. But, Dude, but, but hold on. Did you think that I said the opposite? That nobody should listen to my opinion about whether they should uh, make a personal health decision? Because I said that a lot. No, but I think the thing that, uh, if I remember, the thing that really got to me was this idea that uh, you were saying, well, the anti-vaxxers are all right, but I felt it was a bit, it was a bit tongue in cheek. And I was feeling that. I don't know if it was, if it actually was that. No, um, hold, on, hold on. I, I never said the anti-vaxxers were all right. I, I said, there's no way to know who's right. Because uh, all data is suspect at this point. But pretty right. much all data that we see is motivated by money. It's it's you know terrible studies i mean there was a study the other day i don't know if this will hold up but there was a study that said the placebo effect one of the most you know well understood phenomena is because everybody who did a test on it was doing the uh, the test wrong and they forgot to include the people who didn't know that they were being tested because people improve on their own on average so you get about a third of the people will just improve on their own but they were never tested it was only the people with the pill that worked or they hoped, and one that was a placebo. So some of the most basic data-driven things that we've believed are actually just complete bullshit. And the the data coming out about the uh, everything from you know every part of COVID, from vaccines to everything else, was completely non-credible from the start. Well, this is actually a great segue, conveniently, to talk about uh, your concept of loser think. Um, perhaps I may be engaging in a bit of it myself. Um, could you describe, for people who don't know, what, what, is, what is loser think? <laughs> well, loser think was uh, sort of a catch phrase for any unproductive way of thinking. So basically, it was a, a lot of stuff you see on the internet where people don't have the basic skills of, for example, just comparing two options. Uh, let me give you one example. The, the most common thing you see in, in opinions on the internet is somebody says, this thing is bad, but compared to what? Like the, the most basic logic is it has to be compared to either doing nothing <clears throat> or to do some alternative. But people will just say, this thing's bad, and they, they believe they've added value. And a reasonable person would say, pretty much everything has some good and some bad. So if you're not comparing it to the other thing that's got some good and some bad, you've said nothing. So that's just a simple example, but there there's so many of them you see on the internet. Well, and, and for the longest time, <laughs> and I found a lot of amusement in this, uh, you had this thing where you were going hashtag artist. <laughs> and <laughs> and I noticed that uh, one of the earliest chapters in, in your Loser Thing book is about artists. And, uh, you know, but it, it was interesting because... Uh, <clears throat> You know, well, explain that. Explain that. I, I was using the hashtag, just the word artist. Yeah. When, whenever I saw a tweet, usually it was a criticism of me, uh, that there was just a personal attack with no factual, logical, rational anything. And, and, and the first thing I do is I check the bio. Right. And one of the things you find is if you're a best selling author, anybody who is not is pretty sure you're ugly, stupid. Uh, your intentions are bad, and you've never written a good book. And if you wrote a book, they could have done it better. Like it, it's just the thing about artists, you know, where we we tend to be competitive. Yeah. So you, you so you say we? Do you consider yourself an an, an artist? I mean, I, I feel like I recall. I feel like I I, I think I recall uh, you saying that you know I'm pretty bad at drawing. And <laughs> <laughs> well, well, if you use art in the most expansive sense, um, I think my writing is pretty good. 
and and I do you know I do this I do live streaming as well so I mean you're an artist um you're doing this I, I think it's all art but yes uh, I'm not a I'm not a good drawer and never have been I actually have a uh I have a better artist doing my drawing now because I fried my hands so I write it do the first draft looks kind of sketchy and then my uh my art director finishes so then you know I I have a um a newsletter. I mean, it's really a Substack, but I don't want to use that because everyone has a Substack, a Substack now. Um, <clears throat> but it's called the State of the Arts, and it's a very broad question. I didn't expect to ask it of you, but uh, I mean, you know, you use hashtag artist, and you know, there's so many elements right now that are. Uh, let's not speak too broadly. So now I'm self-conscious because I'm talking to you, but you know, the, the theater, theaters are falling apart. Uh, Hollywood uh, seems to be having trouble putting out uh, blockbusters. I'm seeing the opera is, is dying. Live music is doing okay. Um, I think independent musicians are doing all right. Um, you know, writers seem to be doing okay, but in general, it seems like these, these arts industries and these arts institutions seem to be kind of um, um, falling into dis uh, in, in, into disrepair. And, uh, and I wonder, you know, could you talk about the talent stack? And, uh, you know, I'll ask you to explain that a little bit as well. But it seems to be it seems to me like this, we're in an era where so many things are changing. And I just wonder if these institutions now are failing, partially because they're not reading the room, but also because they're failing to adapt. Do you have any opinions on that? That's kind of broad and not making a specific I, point. I, I think the biggest factor is attention span. Because if you look at the, let's say, short reels on Instagram, they're growing like crazy. If you look at YouTube, you know, it's usually tight and you can get it without commercials. That, that's growing too. Twitter is growing. It's all short form. But I, I can't even imagine sitting through a three-hour movie. There, there was some big movie recently that was three hours long. And I was a little bit interested until I found that out. And I thought, what can I do for three hours that wouldn't make my brain just melt? Like nobody has that attention span anymore. So in my in my opinion, movies are no longer a viable form. But I'll go further and say that television with commercials is also not a viable form. Because I don't know if, if you ever tried to watch a news program in the morning, it's when they, they hit the commercials especially hard. Just randomly turn on a show. See if you hit a content of a show or the commercial. It's about 60% commercial. So it's completely unwatchable. Well, I often think that CNN is just a clip creation thing so that the real business is the clips on the internet. And then the show is just creating clips because nobody's going to watch that for long because the commercials. That's true. I mean, you know, especially with network television, episodic television, I mean, I, I kind of feel bad for the writers because they're, they're, you know, they're writing in 12 to 15 minute bursts so they can, you know, something has to happen before the commercial break. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and you know, with the emergence of long form series uh, on Netflix. So, I mean, I push back a little bit because I think people, you know, they're binging these shows, they're binge watching these shows. So I think the attention span is there. And with the with the contrast between the CNN soundbite thing that everyone's sick of, we now see the emergence of um, long form conversations just like this one. So I, I do think it's I'm encouraged that there seems to be a hunger for for material that's of, that's more weighted and more depth. But uh, what do you have to say about that? Because you want to say yeah, something. Let, let me let me add something because I uh, you you exposed a weakness in what I just said because Joe Rogan can do three hours and it's the biggest content in the world. Yeah. So let me let me revise that a little bit. Content it looks for its own size, right? So this, the people that Joe Rogan has on has on they're the wrong people for a CNN five minute hit. They really are three hour people. I think they should be two, but you know, three, two, three works. Um, so when we do this, correct me if I'm wrong, you will end when you think you've got a good product. And we've kind of said the, the things and we don't want to go to like, you know, just keep talking forever when it's not interesting. So you you have the freedom in this form, same as I do in my live stream, to have it exactly the right size. When I was writing a TV show, the Dilbert TV show, it had to be, I think, 22 minutes or something. And I would write a script. And then the only way they could make you fit the 22 minutes, because I didn't want to be short, so I made it longer than 22, they would cut the only things you could cut without losing the you know connecting tissue of the story. And that turned out to be the jokes. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. This is, the, the, I know, I know. Seriously, I would watch the show and I'd say, oh, here comes the good joke. What? 
And I wouldn't even know until it was on the air. So I would watch it for the first time when it was on TV. I would write the scripts. And the only way they could fit it to the time slot was these little chunks of jokes are, are not necessary to tell you where the script is going. So you cut those. They're the only things you could cut. Now, imagine that. Now, imagine you're making a movie and you're saying, all right, this probably needs to be a 45 minute movie, but I can't sell it unless it's two hours. So you make it two hours. Like the, every, everything that's the old form where what mattered was the length. Let me give you another example. So, you know, my most recent book. So it has to be about this big or people will say it's not a book <laughs> and they won't buy it, right? A book has to be a certain size. Certainly. So books are still in the world where you, you got to hit the size. Now, as luck would have it, you know, I had the content to create a proper book, but this could have been, you know, two or three times the size. But for this specific material, this is exactly the right size you know, kind of a long plane ride kind of a size. Yeah. But uh, so that's a big, that's a big effect nobody talks about is, and by the way, uh, Larry David, I think was the pioneer of this for his TV show on HBO, mm -hmm. Curb Your Enthusiasm. He apparently he had enough clout that he would make the show the size it needed to be and, and HBO would just have to live with it. <laughs> they just had to figure it out. You know, he would just make the show that he wanted to make. Yeah, apparently um, when they were working on Seinfeld as well, you know, the, the studio execs would come in and try to give notes. And uh, apparently, you know, Jerry or Larry would, Jerry and Larry, uh, would be, would be you know, playing golf or something and be like, no, no, I, I think it's fine the way it is. And uh, if you try to change it, I'll quit. <laughs> and, and Seinfeld is Seinfeld. Curb your enthusiasm is curb your enthusiasm. It really is a statement about, um, you know, artists really staying true to, you know, to their instincts and their vision, you know, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, that, that was an interesting show because if you looked at the very first few Seinfelds, they were frankly terrible, you know, and I think they would agree. Uh, but because they were left alone, they got to develop it until, you know, it was one of the best shows ever on TV. Now, the, a, a similar thing in reverse happened with the Dilbert animated show. So we were on two half seasons. The first half season, we didn't know what the show looked like until it came back and it was on TV. So you couldn't adjust, you know, you couldn't say, oh, this, this voice actor was killing it. So we'll give that person more lines. You know, we know, we know what their wheelhouse is and we, we know what, it, what the look is. You do more of the things that work, but we, we got, you know, dinged after the second half season because UPN was making some changes and we happened to be on a Monday night, which they decided was going to be the all African-American comedy night and Dilbert didn't quite fit there. So we lost. Well, I got to say, I was like, how did you end up on UPN in the first place? Because that was like that was like the black network. <laughs> well, but was it before Dilbert? I guess Mo Moesha was on there. It was like Moesha. Um, There's a show called In the House with LL Cool J. Um, that It was like that to me that the, UPN, which I guess maybe morphed into CW or something. But th th to me, like that was where, you know, they had all these black shows it was like fox and upn and yeah i guess i guess they decided to you know sort of solidify that and i was in the wrong place at the wrong time well i'm sure nicole hannah jones is somewhere uh very very pleased with that uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> with that information Probably. and uh, so then the question another thing that pops up for me is um and again it's, it's a bit outside the scope of this particular podcast but i and i i i look back to what I am reading you tweet. And I just, again, it's not a broad question, but how would you say that your views of the world and how it functions have changed significantly over the past maybe five years or not or so? I would say yes, um, not directionally, because I never trusted any big organization. You know, you never fully trust the government if, if you're paying attention. But I didn't know the degree. So directionally, it wasn't a surprise, but the extent of it is just jaw dropping. You know, the, the amount of uh, just corruption that seems to be everywhere, except the elections, the elections are all good. <laughs> you know, it, we, we, we know, for example, that you know, the FBI, the DOJ, the CDC, the FDA, you know, you can go right down the line, Congress is sketchy. You know, you just name an organization and you already know the scandals, right? Mm. I, I'll, I'll name the three-letter anything 
And then you tell me all the scandals and they're real. But luckily, all 50 individual uh, elections in 50 different states, immaculate. Perfect. We're pretty lucky about that. Yeah, it's amazing how that works out, isn't it? And we get the leaders yeah. that we want all the time. Yeah, it's like, it works every time. You know, it's, it's tough because, you know, there's the phrase, I don't know if you've heard it, uh, or a uh, black pilled, where people are just convinced that, um, and I understand it. I mean, I know definitely in the thick of 2020 and 2021, I was just like, wow, wow, everything, everyone that's working at these institutions, it's, it, sort, it sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's just, you know, is anyone telling the truth? And, and then, of course, the door flies open to you know these broad sort of conspiracy theories and i've definitely gone down my own uh, my own rabbit holes uh, absolutely but you know as an actor i've always tried to break things down to very like mundane and i think you do this too as well like to mundane human motivations and if once you begin doing that you don't need any sort of broad overarching like there's this you know hydra like um you know serpent that's controlling everything it's like no you know if you're an octogenarian um bureaucrat who is uh, looking at the end of his career and maybe you botched the hiv um um aids epidemic uh, a little bit um but you know you serve these pharmaceutical companies you're trying to secure your legacy you're trying to you know win some awards or whatever you're going to behave in a certain way and, and you know that you control all this funding and uh, you know and research grants and everything and so no one's really going to talk back to you i mean it's 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 so it's so simple to just break things down and say this is bureaucratic um you know loser think these are a bunch of these are a bunch of careerists who you know they may not be bad people you know i, I don't think that they're maybe principled but at the same time, if I'm putting myself in a position of someone who has a family, they have a mortgage, they have cars, they have, they have credit cards to pay off, they have, um, you know, status, stature, they want to maintain all of that. There's a lot of incentives there to, you know, just kind of turn the other, you know, turn the other way and, and overlook, you know, mistakes, errors or whatever. You want to please your bosses. You want to please, you know, if you're working for the president, obviously you want to please that person as well. Um, it's just, it's, it's. So I don't feel like you really need these big overarching things, just people acting in their own self-interests, trying right. to get something yeah. done. Yeah, I, I mean, in the, if you asked me five years ago, if let's say 97% of scientists or experts agreed on something, I would have said that means something. I would have said, well, you know, you can't get 97% of professionals to lie or to even be wrong about something you know, that's basic. But once we went through the pandemic and we saw, you know, we saw that uh, professionals would line up wherever their paycheck was. In other words, if, if you had said something that was, you know, opposed to the standard procedure, your, your uh, career was over and it was pretty fast and everybody knew it. Now, under those conditions, I can give you 90, well, I can give you 100%. I'll give you 100% agreement of experts on any topic whatsoever. You, you, the topic could be water is really dry. Like it could be anything. And I'll say, but you'll be fired for sure if you disagree, 100 percent you know, agreement. So if you were in the climate uh, world, so and this is not even an argument about climate change itself. It's only about the, the situation of the scientists. There is no way that you could imagine that you could disagree with the you know, main points of the consensus and have a career. No way. So that should be 97%, even if you changed out all the people. If you took those people and you just said, get out of here, you're, you're not part of the data, we're going to get a whole new bunch of people, it'd still be close to 100%. Yeah. Like the, the miracle is that anybody said the other. <laughs> and, and I think that they were either near retirement or already independently wealthy. I don't think anybody else could disagree. Uh, likewise, being already canceled, there are things that I can say that the ordinary person can't say. It's um, <clears throat> it, it's it's frustrating for me because uh, you know I mean I think Jordan Peterson kind of made this point as well at one point uh, is that people were talking about fu money basically and that's you know people who can people who actually say the truth they're either retiring or they're rich right. and my question is you know why why should we have to put up with or why do we even have a society or a culture where that's even true why is it and it's not 
it's it, I, I add a third party to that as well. It's not just the rich or the retired. It's also like, you know, like working like poor people who will always tell you exactly what they think because they don't <laughs> they don't have they don't have time or space to mince words. They get think like they got to get this done right now and they don't care. You know, they got they got bills to pay. They ain't worried about all of that. But right. I, for me, I'm like, why is it that, um, you know, I mean, I don't I don't consider myself to be too extreme in my opinions. And yet here I am. Um, you know, I, I know full well that uh, if I try to go back into into acting, people assure me that it will be that way. But I'm like, well, yeah, but it's also a, an environment where if you recognize sexual dimorphism, you're seen as, as, as an extremist. So <laughs> I mean, but at the same time, you know, I, I, like I'm, I'm depressed and broken, all that other shit. But I like you said, I, I can say what I what I want. And it seems like there's a big hunger right now for people who are doing that because there's so much lot, so much lying and corruption going on. Yeah. Uh, w w was that a, a question or are you just saying that the people are just staying away from fields like like acting? Well, I, I, I just think that um, I'm sort of echoing what you were saying about, uh, you know, you well, now that you're canceled, you can actually say what you want. But I guess if, you know, you're too young. You can, you cannot say what you want. I wouldn't even advise. That's so it. crazy that you said that. That's so, and you don't advise it. That's so crazy to me. Yeah, I don't advise it. How how would it be good for you? I, I can't see a scenario where you come out ahead. Well, it hasn't been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what we can do. If you're watching this podcast, they should follow you, right? They should subscribe on YouTube. Where where else should they find you? Oh, well, you can find well, you can find me on Substack at the State of the Arts. You can find Substack. me on Twitter at Clifton A. Duncan, um, and and here on YouTube. But uh, you know, if, if there is a question in that, I mean, do you do you see a way out of this ditch? I mean, the, the, like the idea that someone could be too young to actually say what they think is just mind blowing to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I would hate to be in your situation, but I, but I was there once. Let, let me tell you a little story about when I worked for a big bank in my early 20s, it was my job to pull together reports about how the individual branches were doing. And I went to my boss one time, who was a senior vice president, and I said, you know, there's a problem. I know the data is wrong, so we shouldn't do these reports because they're, they're basically random because I know the data is wrong and there's no real way to get the right data. And my boss said to me, that's okay. I'm only going to use it when it agrees with me. <laughs> and, he, and he wasn't joking. Yeah. You know, he, he would know, for example, which managers he thought were underperforming, but he needed some data. So you look at the report, and if the report said they were underperforming, whether it was true or not, he, he used it to get rid of them. So I learned really easily or early that data is pretty much all motivated. Like, it, it doesn't matter where it comes from, it's motivated, and I was I was part of that. I mean, I was part of the people who pretended data was real when I knew it wasn't. So <clears throat> I guess one of my final questions for you then is uh, and it's a nice, nice little segue there, maybe convenient uh, bit of uh, marketing there is like, how do we refrain, uh, refrain, reframe our brains? Um, what, I mean, is that, again, I mean, I'm sort of repeating myself, but I mean, is that the way out? Is it's going to be up to individuals sort of re retooling their thinking? And, and that's like sort of the white pill. That, that's the way forward. That's how we get out of this ditch. Well, all action follows thought. So if we're not thinking right, we're not going to act right. So right. if you don't like the way society is acting, it, there's going to have to be a reframe that that activates people to act differently. I'll tell you the, the big reframe, and it, it got me canceled because I didn't have time to explain it. Here's the big reframe. We, we are all being duped into uh, some kind of animosity based on race and gender and, and all these other things. None of that seems to be real person to person, right? I, I, don't may, I don't think I've ever met an individual that I had some problem with for any reason at all, other than behavior, I suppose. But the reframe that we need is to figure out, and, and let me put it this way. If you accept that systemic racism is real, as I do, I think the biggest source of it is the, um, the teachers unions, because they're the ones who are suppressing the performance of schools in general, and, and that's the biggest thing that you need for anybody who's below the, you know, the income line. They need to get up. So it, under, under that situation where there's systemic racism, if you focus on the systemic racism, then what you do is naturally you have some ESG, you've got some CRT training, 
you've got some DEI. But the problem is that they all have the same base assumption, that there's an oppressed class and an oppressor class. Now, that may be true, but here's the reframe. If you focus on that, you will lose. I mean, society will lose. You might find some small benefits in the short run, but society comes out more divided and it makes it dangerous to be with each other. For example, you and I having a conversation on the podcast, perfect, right? No issue whatsoever. But if you knew that you were working in a work group where half of the people believe that you were part of the oppressor class, they would see confirmation bias would guarantee this. They would see things that might be natural behavior. They would see it as potentially racist. Now, if you put yourself in a situation where people are primed to see that frame, you're, you're definitely going to get in trouble. And you're also convincing some group of people that they should avoid anybody who would see them as an oppressor. Now, if you ask me, should I hang around with people who believe I'm their problem? The answer is no, <laughs> absolutely not. But if we make the mistake that the average of one group is important compared to the average of another group, you immediately get into the wrong frame and you get div division. However, here's the reframe. If you empower individuals to have the best strategy for life success, which is what my books are about, um, then people can slice through systemic racism like it doesn't exist. Or better, I can teach this. this. If you think of systemic racism as an obstacle, it is. It is because it's in your mind and you'll see it everywhere. And you'll imagine that your performance is, is always held back by that. If you see the main thing that you need to do is to build skills, suddenly you'll use that energy of racism and you'll harness it and it will be a weapon for you. For example, if you assume racism exists and everybody's primed to see it, go to a Fortune 500 company because you know they're looking for as much diversity as they can get. It's, it's a very high priority. And all of the energy of racism is now your tool. So you walk into the interview, you're qualified, the other people are qualified. The company says, you know, you're both qualified, but I need more diversity. So I get a, I get a twofer for you. So if you see systemic racism as holding you back in every way, it will. If you see uh, yourself as a, let's say, a sovereign individual who can really change who you are, add skills, for example, learn how to deal with people, put together a talent stack, as I call it, uh, think more in terms of systems instead of discrete goals. That's a, that's a good uh, life strategy as well. You're going to find that, that you can slice through not just systemic racism, but all the other problems. So it's basically the, the solution to all of your problems is the same. Make yourself as strong as possible you know, within a, a legal framework. Well, it's very strange, you know, because I think it's a powerful idea. And it's one that I've, <clears throat> once I began to reframe my thinking, I said, well, you know, I said pretty much the same thing is that it's, it's a mindset shift um, amongst, uh, it's a sort of, not even societal, but like, like a collective mindset shift. But uh, the, the difficulty now is that uh, we, you know, there are, there are, I mean, I, I did this thread that went viral um, many months ago about, you know, if I were a white supremacist and it was basically like, you know, if I were a white supremacist, I wouldn't really say anything. You know, I wouldn't say it overtly. What I would do is, and you alluded to this, I would take over the schools. I would, I would pump the same message through the media. I would, you know, make all the movies about this, all of my favorite athletes and singers. Uh, would be, you know, pumping out the same message. The algorithms would be steering me towards these the same messaging. So there's there's this big, pervasive, ubiquitous um, propaganda that is very, very difficult to escape. And and then what you find as a black person, because it is that the second that you do escape that, then you become reviled by uh, by a lot of other black people for one, um, but also by a lot of like white leftists, which is hilarious because um, they're supposed to be on your side. Um, but, but it's funny because I remember, you know, when you, uh, for your fifth cancellation, um, when you, you know, you, you made those comments and um, remember my reaction to it was very visceral and it was, and it was, and it was a dual reaction because on one hand I was like, I was like, I can't believe he said that. But the other part, what the, the other part of what, 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 but the other part of it was, I can't believe he said that. 
not neither reaction was to the substance of what you were saying. Right. You know what I mean? It was just right. the fact that you said it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that I was reacting to, because I think fundamentally um, it's 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 correct. It's you know, you have to you have to change yourself, uh, you know, and then the world will change around you. But I mean, there are literally people now who say things like punctuality, discipline, you know, rugged individualism, these kinds of things, anything that, could, that you could use to improve your life. You get ahead, um, yeah. Well, it's it's seen as a tool of white supremacy. I'm not even joking about this. Did you see that um, that oh, Smithsonian no. uh, 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 exhibit uh, or uh, flyer that they, they had to remove from the website because it caused such an uproar? I mean, it literally said these things. And um, you know what I found is that you know when I was a kid, it was always because I speak a certain way because I don't dress a certain way. It was like, oh, you know, you're you're acting white. And a lot of black people feel this if they you know if they uh, you know if they I mean even Larry Elder, you know, what I mean the the uh, re uh, Republican. Um, presidential nominee was called the black face of white supremacy, uh, you know. Um, so so on, on, on one hand, if you're a black person, you have the sort of like working lower class blue collar people who are saying that you're acting white. But now it's also happening is you have this intellectual class. I call them I call them the blue bourgeoisie, um, this intellectual class. You know, they have book deals. They win Pulitzer Prizes. They get hosting gigs on CNN and MSNBC. You know, you know, they, they get columns in The New York Times. And now they're saying the same things. Oh, if you are if you're striving for ec for economic prosperity, you are enacting whiteness. And so it's, yeah. it's a it's a it's a crushing, you know, it's it's an uphill battle to try to get that sort of mindset. So I actually have a name for it. I, I call it the uh, the imitation glass ceiling. And what I mean by that is I believe all success comes from imitation. Now, in some cases, somebody will read a book, so they're essentially imitating the author. But most people are looking to just people around them. You know, you're looking to your dad, you're looking to people who have success, and you're trying to copy them. You know, I, I came from a you know low middle class income uh, family, but I was obsessed as a kid to figure out how people had got out. Like, how did you do it? How did you do it? And that, and that became the my life's work to put, put together the tools so anybody who doesn't start with money can make money. So that's what I do. Now the problem is if you're black. Um, well, if you're black, <laughs> let, 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 let me talk to you like you're actually there. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this. How comfortable are you imitating the people that you've been told are your oppressors? Because most of the people who have made money are a whole bunch of white people, you know, more recently Asian and the Americans are doing great. But if you had to imitate somebody, which is the one and only way anybody succeeds, not, nobody's invented a new way. You just look at other people and try to pick their best things and then imitate them. But if you can't imitate them because, and I'll put myself in your shoes, for example, if I were black and I learned the history of racism and you said, all right, now to be successful, act like those people who are your oppressors. I wouldn't do it. I'd probably do something unproductive because I, I, I just wouldn't be able to wrap my head around it. So here's what I'm doing. Creating with Joshua Lysak, we're uh, building, after this book is promoted, we're building a student guide so that any homeschoolers or public schools, if they want, would have, you know, a starting set of success tools, which would be obviously for everybody. So if you can just get it, drive it down into the, you know, the fourth grade or wherever you need to start, then everybody at least knows the tools. And if they heard it from, let's say, the teacher that looks like them, Perfect. You know, if you had a black teacher, black class, black teacher says, here's a bunch of tools. Kids say, all right, if you say so, I'm going to imitate you. That, that's your ideal situation. Because if you take away the, the imitation part, I don't know how you can succeed. Well, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's tricky because on one hand, I usually dismiss out of hand the concept of representation. I think it's sort of racist in its own way, like, you know, because one can take the place of all of us. However, I've also... Um, you know, I've been in positions where like if I'm doing a show and um, I was doing a show in Baltimore, for instance, and um, the theater had um, the sort of outreach program where you would go to these um, these troubled schools and you would talk to the kids there. And what I noticed when I was in the class, you know, and this is like this old it's, we we're doing this old play called The Rivals. It's one of the funniest plays ever written, but it's this old 18th century British comedy. And, um, you know, and I'm in it. I'm doing the full accent and everything. And it's, you know, farcical and funny and hilarious. And 
when I was in this one particular class, I remember, you know, these these black boys, they were looking at me and they and they couldn't really mask their intrigue and their interest. And I said, I feel what you're feeling right now, because you are looking at me like, who is this dude? You know, like there, I, I felt them looking for something to inspire them. And I felt them looking for someone to look up to. And <clears throat> so I think there is some merit in this idea that people can look like them. The problem um, is that uh, me personally, to answer your question, I mean, look, my, my last girlfriend was Japanese American, right? And her sisters were married to a bunch of Jewish guys. And I'm looking at all this prosperity, like, teach me, teach <laughs> me. But the thing is, you know, because we, we, we went to go see a film called Fruitvale Station, uh, which starred uh, Michael B. Jordan. Um, and it was based on a true story. I think the guy's name was Oscar Grant, who was killed by, um, by a BART um, police officer. And it was a very powerful movie, very well done. And I remember, you know, we were both crying at the end of it. And I felt like she didn't feel the injustice enough. And at one point, she really pissed me off because she goes, well, you know, Clifton, um, not everyone is out to get you. And I was, my initial reaction was like, no, man, you understand what, you know, but once I began to internalize this and she was a really big part of that, you know, and you know, I, I, I let all of that animus go and that guard came down. Matter of fact, when I was in conservatory, I had a teacher who said, look, I've been, I've been teaching for three decades and every single black male who comes through here has that same armor up that you have right now, because, you know, you're, you're trained from when you're a kid to think that everyone is trying to get you. Everyone is out against you. And once I relinquished that mindset, then um, my work got better, my career improved, my relationships got better. Um, and that and, and I and I want that for other black people. But the thing is, again, like I said before, you have these people who come through and they say, well, everything you're doing right now, you're just aping your oppressor. And I'm somebody who was like, look, I mean, I was this, just this is a few weeks ago. I was watching, you know, money management channels. There's a guy, a, a black Christian dude I was watching. I'm an atheist, by the way. So I'm watching this guy. And I watched a rabbi's video after that about how, you know, how to make money, how to run business. And I'm like, look, I don't care where the information is coming from. You know, I, I feel a certain way about my life. I want to improve my circumstances. And what you find is that, especially with among Asians and Jews, a lot of resentment, a lot of resentment going on. And, you know, I remember the, the attacks in uh, like New York or San Francisco right now, you see um, Asians and Jews being attacked. And a lot of the perpetrators look like me. And part of the reason is resentment. And, uh, you know, and you just, you just feel, you wish that you could um, say, guys, you know, there's, there's another way, you know, there, there's another way to, to do things and all this other stuff, even if it is true about racism, it won't matter because you will be so powerful that all this other crap won't even matter. See, see, here's the hardest thing to explain. The truth doesn't matter to your success. And that, that's actually a big theme of my reframe book. There are a lot of reframes that are not uh, logical or even reasonable, but they help to tune your brain to be successful. Let me, let me give you one that seems relevant. Now, mm. this might not work for the Black experience, but it would work for somebody who has any kind of trauma that is dogging them. And it sounds like that's a situation where the past is dogging. I sometimes try to imagine that we don't understand reality whatsoever, <laughs> that, that we don't understand anything about it. So you can imagine it any way that works best. One of the ways that works best is I imagine that we're a simulation, effectively a video game, and we may have some master that put us in the game or maybe we're the avatar for them, but you play like you just spawned. In other words, if you woke up into your life, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. If I woke up into this life, I've been, you know, canceled. I've had, you know, millions of my own problems that, you know, follow me through my life. But if I suddenly came into life right now with my same set of tools, and I woke up in my house with the friends I have, the situation I have, and somebody said, all right, game on. You have to use the things you were born into, whatever they are, and then, you know, make something of yourself. I'd say, all right, and then I would just forget about all the other stuff. You know, I would look at what's what I have, and I say it's a new game. So if you're black in America, if you if you were to do that exercise, you'd wake up. The entire legacy of slavery and discrimination and Jim Crow, imagine they don't exist. Now this is the part where we're not using reason or logic. 
because they do exist. They're, they're real, like they really happen. <clears throat> but pretend like they didn't. Just use the stuff you have in front of you. You're probably, well, let's, let's say there's a good chance that you know how to go to the gym and eat right and take care of yourself. So you probably look great. And if you don't, it's an option. You know, work harder to make yourself look great. You know how to build a talent stack. You know, that's another thing I teach. One skill will get you a little bit of a paycheck. Two skills that are compatible doubles your paycheck. And let's say you added to your base skill uh, public speaking. Quite easy to learn. You know, a lot of people do it. You just have to take a class, practice. If you can do a job, but you're also the person who can speak in front of a group, who's going to be the boss when they need a new boss? It's not the people who can't do that. So if you took some, you know, management classes, maybe on the side, you learned, uh, let's say, negotiating or sales, things which you can learn without the benefit of a, you know, a huge degree. But you build yourself a little pile of skills, which each one works to double the value of the one below it, which is, again, if you'd never met anybody who told you what I just told you, my God, what a disadvantage, my God. Because everybody who does what I said puts together a little package of the right skills. Take, take uh, Joe Rogan. He's not just talking to a microphone. He's a professional comedian. He's been an actor. He follows politics. He's unusually um, personable and charismatic, so he can get people to you know open up and stuff. That's not one skill. That's probably almost 12 different skills including just the business part of making a run. I mean, obviously he's had to hire people and negotiate contracts. He's had to get lawyers. He's got accountants, I assume. And all of that is a separate skill. If you, if you say to yourself, my money equals the size of my talent stack, and now not a random talent stack, but things that work well together, you know, kind of the Joe Rogan model, uh, then you're, you're going to go places and there's almost nothing that can stop you. So imagine being born into a world where learning a new skill is practically free. The mechanism for getting rich is clearly laid out. Get this skill and then keep adding to it. Or, you know, you might change businesses, but then start again and add those skills. If you just do that, stay out of jail, stay off drugs, don't have a baby before you're ready, you're fine. And, and then on top of that, I would say, uh, use the energy reframe. The systemic racism is not an obstacle. It's an energy. It's an energy that can kill you, or it's an energy that you can harness, walk into the Fortune 500 company with your talent stack and say, you can hire other people, but if you hire me, you get a twofer. You know, I'll help your diversity situation, but I'm also great at my job. You bring that to anybody, and I can I can spawn you into the world and make you successful as long as you can release on the past. If you can't release on it, you have no chance. Well, that's probably the biggest barrier, uh, you know, and there, <clears throat> I already know, there was an article at least 10 years ago, this, um, this conservative published about, you know, if I was a young black man, and he said some of the things that you were talking about, and it caused such an uproar and such a backlash. However, um, you know, I, I do think that uh, what you're saying obviously has lots of merit. Let's just hope that we can get your book and your books um, into the hands of the readers who need them the most. And I will say there's a few encouraging trends happening. Um, one is that uh, homeschooling among black Americans has increased uh, by something like 16 percent, I think, over the past few years. That's so, not enough. <laughs> that's not enough. That, I, mean, I know, that's, but it's, but it's moving in that report. direction. That, that needs to be 300 percent. Yeah. Yeah. But it's but it's moving in that direction. And I will say another thing that is, that is interesting. Um, and, you know, I don't want to keep you here. I know we're, we're going a little bit over. But, uh, you know, I, I, there's a schism right now happening because black men right now are migrating away from uh, the Democrat Party, which I find is really, really fascinating because I think they're, they're seeing some of the same things as well. They're saying this isn't working. You know, maybe I'm not I'm not going to put on a MAGA hat, but at the same time, um, what these people have been, you know, selling me, clearly it's not really, it's not really happening. So I do think there are some, um, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's amazing to think that you have this really polarizing Republican president, right, who just, who everyone was calling racist and everyone was calling a Nazi for nonstop. And yet he still is picking up 
um, these demographics, which apparently he's supposed to hate. And so I think that's a, a really, really powerful indicator that maybe ideas like yours and, uh, and mindsets like yours, uh, reframing like yours, uh, as it were, um, loser think I'm trying to work in all the titles of your books, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, maybe they can win bigly, um, <laughs> nice. you know, if, 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 if they can, but, uh, Scott, you know, I feel like I could talk to you for forever about a variety of things, but uh, I'll close it here. Where can people find and support you and how can they get your new book? Uh, main thing is my new book, Reframe Your Brain, uh, available now on uh, Amazon. That's that's the easiest place to get it. Uh, soft cover and ebook now, audio book and large cover pretty soon. So, have you got anybody to read it yet? Because uh, I'll volunteer if you want. I'll 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 I'll, uh, I'll improve your diversity quotient and uh, send, <laughs> I'll send, send, me mail, send me your mailing address. I'll send you a, I'll send you a physical book. Oh, wonderful. Um, that's a, that's a soft no, but I appreciate that. Uh, this no, that's a yes. <laughs> just, just DM me your address and I'll, I'll send you a book. Oh, well, shit. Well, there we go. Well, uh, Scott Adams, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, thank you for putting up with, uh, with my pukage. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 uh, I, it's so fascinating to me just because, uh, you know, like, like I said, you did, we got into a little bit and, and there were some things that you were like, that, that you said, I was like, I don't, uh, but it, it's always been like, this guy always has something interesting to say. And so I always appreciate um, that guys like you were out there putting out your thoughts and opinions in a very succinct and, uh, and uh, persuasive, shall I say, manner. So, uh, you know, you, you've been canceled, you're old enough to tell the truth. Um, I, so I appreciate you for doing that. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks for uh, this. Uh, I appreciate it. It was fun. I, I love your questions. You're really good at this, and I hope the uh, I hope if I send anybody to you that they they keep watching. 